Hello and welcome to Tundra Concert number 8 featuring the 1939 film Dark Victory featuring Bette Davis. It apparently was her best uh, film uh, role in terms of her acting ability and I'm sure you enjoy this film if you haven't seen it already. 1939 was a dark time for the period of the world so the subject matter is fairly dark but there's something we could all learn from that film. Uh, I do hope you enjoy uh, the, the concert. I'm just filming the uh, opening scenes here at St Christopher's in Potts Trigley. Uh, I thought it was a very appropriate background to in introduce Dark Victory. Anyway, do enjoy the uh, concert. <laughs> Hello there. I hope you enjoyed that opening music, which was a piano rendition arrangement by me of All the Things You Are, written by Jerome Kern and words by Oscar Hammerstein II. Uh, and that was written in 1939 in the year of the film Dark Victory. So this is how the concert all fits together. It's mainly around the dates of 1939. Now, let me give you a brief overview about the um, the outline of what Dark Victor is about. It's an actually fantastic play and it's probably her best acting that she ever did. Uh, it's very focused and it's just wonderful to watch. So here's the outline. This is roughly what the film's about. So Judy Traherne, played by Bette Davis, is a young, carefree, hedonistic Long Island socialite and an heiress um, with a passion for horses, fast cars and too much smoking and drinking. She initially ignores severe headaches and brief episodes of dizziness and double vision, but when she uncharacteristically takes a fall from her horse whilst riding and then tumbles down a flight of stairs at home, her secretary and best friend, Anne King, played by Geraldine Fitzgerald, insists that she sees a family doctor and refers her to a specialist. Dr Frederick Steele, played by George Brent, is in the midst of closing his New York City office in preparation for a move to Battleboro in Vermont, where he plans to devote his time to brain cell research and scientific study on their growth. He reluctantly agrees to see Judy, who is cold and openly antagonistic towards him. She shows signs of short-term memory loss, but dismisses her symptoms. Steele convinces her the ailments she has experienced are serious and life-threatening and puts her, his career plans on hold to tend to her. When diagnostic tests confirm her, his suspicions, Judy agrees to surgery to remove a malignant brain tumour. Steele discovers the tumour cannot be completely removed and realises she has less than a year to live. The end would be painless but swift. Shortly after experience total blindness, Judy will die. My first organ piece is Dido's Lament uh, from the aria When I'm Laid to Earth uh, from the opera Dido Aeneas by Henry Purcell. The aria comes at the end of the opera as Dido, having been abandoned by Ananias, flings herself on a funeral pile. I just thought it was a good fit for this concert. Quite interesting fact for you, this was Bette Davis' biggest money maker up to that point in her career. So it's very notable, this film, for her, for many, many different reasons. So here I have my organ arrangement of When I Am Laid in Earth, written by Henry Purcell. <laughs>
For my first organ piece, I'd like to do an organ arrangement of a well-known song of the time from 1938, Thanks for the Memory, written by Ralph Ranger. A quite interesting fact is the scene in Dr Still's office where Judith can't light a cigarette and then a few minutes later she can't light Dr Steele's cigarette was devised by Edwin Goulding. He explained it as, when Bette Davis can't light her own cigarette you know something is seriously wrong with her. So that's why that uh, bit was put in. So here is my first organ piece, Thanks for the Memory, written by Ralph Ranger and arranged by my fair little hand. The song I want to sing for you today is a really, really well-known uh, song uh, from the film uh, Wizard of Oz and it's Somewhere Over the Rainbow and it's written by Harold Arlen in 1938. Some quite interesting facts about this. This was Bette Davis's third Oscar nomination in five years and her second of five consecutive nominations. Bette Davis uh, was nominated for the Academy Award of Best Actress but lost it to Vivian Lee's star of Gone with the Wind. Max Steiner, who wrote the wonderful film track for this film, plus now Voyager and a host of others, he was nominated for uh, the Academy Award for the best original score for both this film, Dark Victory, and Gone with the Wind. But he lost it to Herbert Stothard of The Wizard of Oz. So I thought that's why I'd sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Bit of sour grapes, perhaps. But the film itself lost the Academy Award for Best Picture to Gone with the Wind. So there's the trouble when you release films, uh, your pride and joy amongst some great films you sometimes lose out, and this film did lose out. But anyway, here's Somewhere Over the Rainbow, written by Hal Darland, and uh, I'm arranging, I'm going to sing it for you now. <laughs>
going to sing uh, for you, which I recorded at home, is Moonlight Serenade by Glenn Miller and Mitchell Parrish. And it was written in 1939. A very, very popular tune. I remember this from my childhood. Uh, my nan used to play it all the time. So I thought you might enjoy this. A quite interesting fact. Tom Milne, who's a critic, writes that Davis and director Edmund Goulding almost transformed the soap into style a Rolls Royce of the weepy world, and they certainly did because this film is a real tear jerker. I challenge anyone not to actually cry at the end. So Bette Davis said that this, this was her favourite role to play, and if you watch the film you can see why. So here's me singing Moonlight Serenade by Glenn Miller and Mitchell Parrish. <laughs> And the song that I sing is of moonlight. I stand and I wait for the touch of your hand in the June light. The roses are sighing. A moonlight serenade. The stars. in my Tundra concerts I've been uh, building this tradition where I do some slides that has the cast on it and I put some sort of musical thing I've pre-recorded at home. Uh, what I'd want to do is to again introduce you to the cast, uh, uh, the cast members but also do this lovely arrangement that I did at home this week of All the Things You Are written by Jerome Kern and the words are by Oscar Hammerstein II uh, written in 1939. It is absolutely beautiful, that song. Uh, quite interesting fact uh, that it was her favourite scene, but uh, 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 her favourite film. Uh, and also, Judith, isn't it interesting? She only has a few months to live, yet she amazingly has enough time to plan a wedding, decorate a house in Vermont, and have her blouse monogrammed with her married initials, which she wears in the last scene. It's absolutely amazing how time flies. So here's my rendition of the song as you meet the cast of All the Things That You Are.
We're coming near to the end of the concert and this is where I do my usual spoiler alert. I thought that I would show you the ending for, of this film just like I did with The Ghost of Mrs Muir because the ending is just the most powerful, weepy, uh, kind of amazing uh, screenwriting and I thought I had to show it to you. If you don't want to know the ending, uh, just, just fast forward through this. But um, there were, another scene was actually shot, but ultimately uh, was deemed anticlimactic. After Judith's death, this is the other scene they shot, her horse was seen winning a race and a stable hand, uh, play, Michael, played by Bogart, was shown crying. Now what they did is they actually shown the, the scene to several people before they ever released the film and it was met with such a negative response uh, with sneak preview audiences and so therefore it's cut and we're left with this original and I'm so glad we are. So here's the final ending scene, the last literally two minutes of the film. So if you don't want to look, fast forward. You must go in now. And please understand, no one must be here. No one. So I must show him I can do it alone. Perhaps it will help him over some bad moments to remember it. And be my best friend. Go now. Please. I'm going up to lie down now. Oh, Miss Judith. Daffy! Daffy, Don! Don, come here. Oh, Alex. Alex. Now. Now, go down now. Come on. Go down. you, Martha. Yes, Miss Judith. I don't want to be disturbed.
Well, I hope you've put all your tissues away now after seeing that final ending. Absolutely wonderful. If you haven't seen the film, like all the other films I show you, do go and see it. It's readily available on YouTube and all the other places you can get it. And they do box sets very cheap to Bette Davis films. Now, I just love the final uh, little bit of script because it's so simple and yet so dramatic. Where Judy says as she's kneeling in prayer by her bed, that you, Martha? Martha says, yes, Miss Judith, I don't want to be disturbed. And that's it. And then the angelic music comes in, like the angel chorus comes in, and her eyes, and then she goes out of focus. What a fantastic film. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining me with this Tundra Concert number eight, which is entitled Dark Victory. Um, I'll probably do just one more Tundra Concert for you, uh, in the next week or so because the series of organ recitals are starting on the 12th of March with Paul Parsons so because I've got to film that and also edit the recitals down I may not have enough time but I'll do one more and perhaps a, a nice happy uh, <laughs> film this time because I don't want you thinking that all the films I watch are sad most of them are because I just enjoy those type of films, especially of the black and white variety, because I was brought up with black and white films. Well, thank you very much for joining me for this Tundra concert. I hope you have a lovely week. I hope you keep happy, safe and well. And also, God bless. <laughs>